Welcome to the annual Ada Lovelace Lecture sponsored by the Intramural Research Program of the National Library of Medicine. I'm Valerie Florence. I'm the Acting Scientific Director of NLM's Intramural Research Program. Our program develops and applies computational approaches to a broad range of information problems in biology, biomedicine, and human health. Ada Lovelace Day is an annual event, an international event really, held it every year on the second Tuesday of October. Um, it's a celebration of the achievements of women in STEM, um, in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it aims to increase the roles of women within the STEM sectors and support women already working there. Many organizations, including the National Library of Medicine, hold events on this day. And who was Ada Lovelace? Well, she was an English mathematician and writer born in 1815, chiefly known for her work on Charles Babbage's proposed me mechanical general purpose computer, the analytical engine. Um, and she was the first to recognize that the machine had applications beyond pure calculation. She published the first algorithm intended to be carried out by such a machine. So as a result, she's often regarded as the first human the first computer programmer. Today's talk will be broadcast live and archived in the NIH videocast website. Questions during the presentation can be sent to the following email address. Um, that is nlmsd at mail.nlm.nih.gov. And uh, we, I will present them to the speaker. But right now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Patty Brennan, Director of the National Library of Medicine and a STEM researcher herself who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you very much, Valerie. Good afternoon, everyone. As Valerie said, I'm Patty Brennan, the Director of the National Library of Medicine. I apologize for the strange lighting and the darkness over my face. Um, but I am very, 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 very delighted to introduce you to a friend and colleague, Noemi El Haddad. Dr. Eladad is the 2022 Ada Lovelace Lecturer. She's an Associate Professor of Biomedical Informatics and is affiliated with the Department of Computer Science and the Data Science Institute, all at Columbia University. <clears throat> Excuse me, she served as Vice Chair, serves as Vice Chair for Research and Graduate Program Director for the Department of Biomedical Informatics and recently had a stint as the Acting uh, Department Chair. Noemi's research has been well known at the intersection of medical informatics and women's health. She currently leads a project called EVEN, the Data Powered Women's Health Research Initiative at Columbia University. And she's also leading a longstanding project called Citizen Endo, which advances research in endometriosis through citizen science. Dr. El Haddad's research interests are bringing the power of machine learning and natural language processing to the health and well being of women through technology. She investigates a lot of aspects related to women in the intersection of health data, including using observational data from the electronic health record and patient-generated data from online communities, mobile health data, and strategies to enhance relevant information for clinicians, patients, and health researchers with the goal of improving the health and health care for patients. Prior to joining Columbia's DBMI in 2007, Dr. El Haddad completed her PhD in computer science at Columbia University, and she was an assistant professor in computer science at the City University of New York. She also is an NLM funded researcher and was an NLM trainee. So it's great to see our trainees start going forth in these fabulous careers. The title of Noemi's talk today is Human Centered Approaches, Human Centered AI Approaches for Individualized Self Management Regimes, Regiments. Um, as noted in the description of her talk, Dr. Al Haddad will discuss the challenges and excitement of the research directions for augmenting personal health informatics systems with AI recommendations for self-management strategies that take into account an individual's goals and their context of daily living. Her work is an important contribution to the NLM's effort to support the NIH's direction in expanding the research on women's health. Her work fits under the goals of the Office of Women's Health Research at the NIH, and she will be presenting her research there in a few weeks. Thank you so much, Betty, and thank you, Valerie, for uh, the kind introduction. I, it's such an honor to present today. Uh, I'm very excited. The NLM is my, my home institute, and so it's a, it's a real honor to be here today. Um, the work I'm going to be 
presenting today is funded through an R1 as well as through our training grant or T15 uh, from the NLM as well. And so it only fits uh, to talk about it today. So let me uh, start by saying that I don't have any conflict of interest to disclose. NLM is a research funding and uh, this is also work done in partnership with the Endometriosis Foundation of America. Um, so let me start by reminding everyone on this call uh, that care for chronic condition uh, and chronic illnesses is a global health priority and self-management, uh, that is all the day-to-day -day activities that a patient takes outside of the clinic to uh, help with their quality of life is an important part of, of this care. Um, and in fact, there's been a lot of uh, work in personal health informatics in particular uh, to create technologies that can support uh, patients in self-management. And there's different aspects that have been proposed in the literature from facilitating reflection on your own experience of disease as a patient, scaffolding problem solving, promoting experimentation, helping identify strategies that fit one's lifestyle. And to give you a very practical example to why we need help here, uh, let me take a very simple example. When we have a self-management strategy that is known to clinicians as saying, you know, um, practice uh, more regular exercise, it's a very abstract type of uh, self-management strategies. And in fact, this implementation forces the patient um, to make it work within their own lifestyle, but also to um, to find out when is it going to be potentially okay for them to exercise or given their health status, what is the right way to exercise, which specific exercise would be helpful, etc. All these things are very much a burden on the patient and their caregivers. Uh, and so personal health informatics has been helping towards this. Um, there is still some challenges that have not been uh, completely uh, addressed in the literature, and those are two in particular, the top two here that I'm listing that we're going to be coming back to throughout this talk. The first one is that, you know, in some conditions, it is fairly clear what are the self-management guidelines, or at least, you know, these high-level guidelines like exercise regularly. But there are conditions where there's no established guidelines for self-management, often in conditions that are not well understood like endometriosis, which is a condition I'll be focusing on for this talk. The second is that there are often, uh, and this is valid for many, many conditions, there are heterogeneous responses to different self-management strategies. Um, I'll be talking much more about this during my talk, but let me just give you again a very specific example. Uh, in endometriosis, our patients tell us that running is helpful for some and is actually harmful for others. And this uh, drastic difference in response kind of brings a, an additional challenge when we think about what to recommend to a patient for them to self-manage their condition. So the opportunity here for researchers like me who are interested in using technology and AI to support patients is to think that, um, you know, in which way could artificial intelligence combined with personal health informatic solution could help us identify the strategies that would work for a given individual and their specific context and would able, be able to adapt to these individual's responses in time. So uh, we're trying in a way to think about how AI can help us cater to these two particular challenges. If we don't know in advance what self-management or specific self-management guidelines uh, should be suggested to a user. And uh, in addition, if there are different responses from um, patients, how do we take that into account? So in this talk, I'm going to be first talking to you about endometriosis, giving you a little bit of context and background about it, and in, in particular, what aspect of it is of interest within this research. Um, I'm going to be talking about two different studies that kind of go together. The first one, uh, which was done by my student, Adrian Pichon, uh, is about understanding the management needs of patients and providers. And this was kind of going at it in a very high level fashion, not only thinking about self-management, but just all of management and the work that is 
involved in the care of uh, endometriosis and in particular in the care of a complex enigmatic condition. And then we'll focus in on self-management in particular, and I'll describe a study between um, my student Adrian again and a, a scientist in my lab, Inigo Oteaga, and this is also work in collaboration with Nina Mamakina, a faculty in my department. Uh, and so we're gonna be here thinking about which ways can uh, AI help with self-management, individualized self-management recommendations. We're not here providing any algorithm yet. We're interested in just understanding to which extent this type of approach can be helpful. And we're proposing a, a slightly novel way of um, going at uh, answering this question, uh, which is by uh, putting together the needs of humans as uh, characterized by uh, qualitative uh, research, the current practices of humans as characterized by the data that we've captured from uh, them uh, so far, as well as a understanding of the AI algorithms in particular that we're planning to use, which are the ones of reinforcement learning. And by um, comparing and contrasting the, the constraints that each of these three perspectives provide to us, we can arrive to understanding the feasibility of it, as well as uh, informing what particular areas of research we should be focusing on. So let me start with enigmatic chronic conditions. And what do I mean by that? There are a whole host of conditions where there's no biomarkers to rely on. And it's, it's in fact unclear which symptoms are um, very discriminative toward what this condition is. There, you know, these enigmatic conditions are enigmatic and therefore there's a few guidelines for their diagnosis or treatment. Uh, monitoring is difficult, treatment is difficult. Uh, and those those four things have consequences in how patients experience the disease, but also how they care about the disease on their own and together with their providers. Uh, and so endometriosis is often considered a um, the poster child for enigmatic conditions. It's an, a disease estimated to affect six to ten percent of women in reproductive age, and, uh, and you know it's it's a high number. It's a prevalent condition, and it is maybe surprising that it's still enigmatic. But this is the current state of affairs. Um, it is currently characterized as a reproductive condition, but there is a push in the literature to think of it as a systemic. Uh, maybe inflammatory driven uh, disease. We have found that uh, we as a community have found that there's no clear correlation between the patient experience of the disease, the type of symptoms they report, and the proposed subtypes of the disease that have been primarily surgical as um, shown in this diagram here, which is in fact the surgery, a laparoscopy is a way in which patients are uh, diagnosed. Uh, guidelines are very uh, short and focus on two symptoms, pain during periods and infertility, and hormonal birth control is considered a first-line treatment. So what are the uh, management needs of patients? So there's two questions in particular we were interested in answering. In the work of patients and providers when caring for endometriosis, and so that when we say caring for endometriosis here, we're interested in, in the disease, obviously, but we're also interested in uh, more generally when it comes to diseases that are complex and enigmatic. What is it that uh, in the work of, of these providers and patients specifically is, is made more complicated by this uh, characterization of the disease? And secondly, what role does technology play in facilitating the partnership and the success of care? and which opportunities could we uh, envision. So we did, uh, this was more of a qualitative research where we did interviews with a specialist, endometriosis specialist. We had 10 uh, different specialists from surgeon, gynecologist, physiatrist, pelvic physical therapist, and pain specialist. And we also did in parallel focus groups with patients, uh, 21 participants over five different focus groups. Um, there's, there, you know, we try to go for a diverse range of experiences uh, by looking at the type of uh, how long patients had been diagnosed with the disease, 
you know, more than 10 years, less than five years and five to 10 years. Um, about uh, one third of them was younger than 30 years old and two thirds was 30 or older. I should mention that the, the average age for uh, diagnosis is 36 um, in, in the United States. And about a third of our participants were non-white. So we did, um, we did a semantic analysis of our interviews and focus group transcripts. We identified insights about this idea of work and we used uh, the framework of work, in fact, to help us analyze our, our data. Um, and we were interested again into um, what kind of work is specifically made harder because of the care for an enigmatic condition in the side, on the side of patients and on the side of providers. And uh, how would data and technology be helpful or maybe harmful in uh, supporting this care? So we found that patients want to use their records and their data. They want to be able to construct a holistic picture of their illness trajectory. Um, they want to be able to reflect and make sense of their illness trajectory. Um, and they think of it very much in terms of their short-term health status as well as their long-term journey. So short-term health status would be, uh, since we're gonna be speaking about self-management, would be things like, um, you know, I'm going to try a new diet now, like say an anti-inflammatory diet. And so I need to be able to know whether the diet is working and I'm gonna give myself maybe three months to work on this diet, but I would like to be able to know in which way is it working. And so it's difficult to, um, for patients to know exactly how to answer this question. In fact, in part because this, the disease is systemic. And so, you know, like for many inflammatory driven conditions, um, that could mean a relief in GI symptoms or maybe a relief in joint pain or a relief in the case of endometriosis with pelvic pain um, or a combination of those. And so keeping track of all of these different aspects of the condition and how they change when a, um, when a new strategy is taken into account uh, is, is actually very difficult. And that's more of a short-term thing. But patients also tell, told us that they wanted to keep track and be able to reflect of their long-term journey. And so we're talking here about, you know, since the time of diagnosis and even for some prior to diagnosis. The reason they're interested in this and they need help is because it's difficult day to day to see the changes in, uh, in how the disease progresses. In the case of endometriosis, Progression is not so much a, a concept in the disease, but addition of comorbidities is definitely one. And being able to reflect and identify that maybe there's a new comorbidity you know, that has emerged is uh, definitely something that the patient want to know about and have a hard time doing without being able to have tools to collect and reflect and make sense of their experience. And finally, they wanted... Um, they wanted, um, you know, use data and records to facilitate care. I talked about self-management, but that was also there was also a very strong need to facilitate for a clinical visit and prepare for them. So patients told us that when they were going to all of these different, um, you know, all of these different members of their care team, the surgeon, the gynecologist, etc they were often spending time preparing for these visits. And they were both an instrumental type of preparation as well as an emotional one. The instrumental one had to do with putting together all of the disparate pieces of information into one place from the clinical ones to the one that they tracked on their own. Um, and the emotional one was more about uh, maybe something that is specific to enigmatic condition, which was that there's sometimes uh, this feeling of patients that they're not being heard by their providers. Uh, and there's, in fact, uh, throughout all of our interviews and focus groups, we identified many, many um, misalignments in communication and missed opportunities for shared uh, communications between providers and patients, where providers on one side would tell us, you know, uh, we need to lower expectations of patients when it comes to their treatments, 
And so we're not going to be um, describing so many different um, solutions because there, are, there aren't any. And we're not sure that we can actually help patients in their uh, pain journey or their fertility journey. And on their side, patients felt like their uh, complaints were not heard and were dismissed. And so there was this emotional um, journey that they were going through. Uh, some patients described it as, um, you know, getting ready as a lawyer goes into trial to kind of try to prove to their providers that uh, their symptoms were real and needed um, uh, care. So all of this need for um, putting together the data uh, was a very important thing. And because these uh, diseases are enigmatic, those are the ones we care about, um, it's not clear in advance what which part of these data needs to be uh, taken into account. And so uh, you can imagine that data-driven solutions here that kind of look for what's salient in someone's, um, in someone's trajectory is, would be very useful. The particular complexities of endometriosis that we identified as uh, making all of what we already know is being difficult in all conditions um, where the enigmatic or the lack of medical guidance meant uncertainty and frustration in care, both for providers and for patients. The chronic and temporal dynamics added confusion, uh, and I'll give an example of that in a second. The multifactorial and systemic features, so the fact that um, endometriosis affect the reproductive system, but also affect the GI, the urinary system, sometimes the, um, the lungs or the diaphragm. And there's uh, kind of like different um, dynamics to, the, to how these different uh, symptoms work with each other um, made that uh, patients were overwhelmed by how many things they need to keep track of and which ones are actually the ones to pay attention for their own experience of disease was a big um, complication. And finally, the one that I mentioned and hinted at was this negotiation of knowledge and expertise uh, that in the presence of a disease that is not well understood, uh, both patients and provider end up being their own experts. And there's a lot of uh, interesting power dynamics happening that are reported both by providers and, and patients, and both recognize that they are necessary to that both parties are knowledgeable and have expertise and be, be, beneficial, but there were definitely a lot of misalignments. So let me just give you one example, and I'll just go through one um, as to what we mean by, um, by complexities, uh, and that's one of temporal dynamics. So quite simply, there was this, uh, this part of, and, and the reason I'm focusing on this one is because it will come back later when we think about self-management, which is that on one hand, um, clinicians and providers would be thinking about the disease as uh, something that evolves or care about symptoms across maybe the past three months and would ask, you know, from the last visit, how, will, how have you been feeling? Whereas patients are telling us, well, it depends. Uh, it really changes hour by hour and day by day. And so being able to say, um, you know, how have I felt in the past three months as a patient is actually a tricky question for uh, patients. So there are a lot of design opportunities that we identified. And I'm putting three that I will not be focusing on for the rest of the talk, but are nevertheless quite important and we're working on. Um, the first one was to construct and curate this holistic representation of illness trajectories and health status. Uh, and that meant bringing together data from self-tracking as well as clinical records and uh, being able to curate all of this into a true personal health library. Providing tools to help reflect and make sense of this illness experience. So once you have combined and curated this data, how do you help um, patients make sense of these? And again, data-driven and uh, interactive visualization, AI, all of these are extremely helpful techniques here. And finally, scaffolding the collaboration, the collaborative work uh, between providers and patients was um, was a big deal. Um, and 
uh, we've been working on it. There's a lot, there's actually quite a lot of work in personal health informatics on this idea of scaffolding um, the collaboration between provider and patients. I think here again, the enigmatic aspect is that there are, um, there are tensions between providers and patients and we want to help rather than make them worse. But the one that I want to focus on, and I just noticed a typo on my side in the title, uh, is that we identify this big challenge, which was that uh, self-management, yet because it is essential, is still burden is still definitely burdensome. And so patients keep telling us about this trial and error and self-experimentation that they go through, but it's extremely difficult for them because um, they literally go at it as self-experimentation. They feel like they have no guidance into which, uh, which regimens, which strategies to even try, and they have a hard time identifying whether something works for them, and if so, uh, for how long should they try? There's a lot of really practical questions that they have um, and that need uh, support. So our hypothesis now is that well, we can use artificial intelligence to augment this trial and error process. And in particular, the strategies and the techniques we're interested in come from this field of machine learning called reinforcement learning. And we think it's a promising research direction because it could help to provide personalized adaptive recommendations for self-management. Um, reinforcement learning is good in, in when we have a lot of uncertainty and is good to model individualized responses. And so let me give you a little bit of background about RL. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a very, very active field of research in machine learning, and my uh, description is going to be very basic. And I apologize for that, but I'm going to try to just give you the gist of what I think is going to be relevant to our research in particular. And so I'd love you to focus uh, first on what's in black here, which are the different components of reinforcement learning. There is an agent uh, and there is an environment. And um, there are actions that the agent takes that change the environment. And that in, in, uh, in turn changes both the state in which the agent can then take into account to decide on their next, next action but it also has an impact on what we call the reward, which is really the goal of why we're developing this technique. So you can think of reinforcement learning, like the word, like the name of the technique says, as this iterative process where you're learning what's called a policy um, through iterative and sequential tries of uh, actions. And these actions give you uh, different states and ultimately, the goal is to find this, the optimal set of actions that bring you to the highest reward. So this concept of state, reward, and action are going to come back in our, in our work here. And I, I kind of put uh, what would be the equivalent for us if we were to apply this in a self-management world. Um, the, the state is basically what is the state of a participant, or at least that's how we're envisioning to model this. You could think of a state of a participant as their health status today, as well as uh, anything happening, their circumstances on that day of. And so maybe a circumstance is um, easily capturable by data. Maybe it's not. Maybe it is something like, you know, uh, it's a busy day at work today or it's snowing outside. Um, health status would be anything that I can capture through technology about the health status of a patient. The agent would be all of these self-management recommendations that we would be we would want to be able to provide to the to the patient, and so we're going to have to decide on a on a number of uh, recommendations. And there's going to be what we call a uh, action space, uh, which would be all the different self-management strategies that one can consider one at a time. And finally, the reward would be what is the goal for this particular self-management regimen? When we're modeling um, reinforcement learning in this case uh, and uh, you know, applying it to the question of self-management, we're gonna have to make decisions about how to model 
the state, how to model the goal, and how to model this action state. In other words, we want to be able to operationalize this idea. And then a very uh, big question is um, that there are many different algorithms out there to build this idea of reinforcement learning. And in fact, um, most of the successes of reinforcement learning have come from these techniques, which we probably cannot use in this context. Reinforcement learning currently is using, um, um, relying on ex extremely large amounts of data and deep reinforcement learning strategies are learning through a very high number of uh, simulations. And so this is how maybe you've seen some videos of uh, robots learning to go through an obstacle course or building a an agent that can learn to walk or building a game that can, uh, an agent that knows how to play the game. And these things are done through tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of simulations. We obviously cannot afford to do this in the context of self-management. We could be thinking maybe of doing a digital twin or something like that, but we definitely we know that much cannot ask, um, you know, a human to try a self-management strategies a thousand times in a row. The same way we cannot ask a user to try every potential action out there, even if it makes no sense for a human. And so the whole question we're going to be attempting to answer here is how can we figure out whether it will be feasible to build a a model that uses RL, reinforcement learning, but is also very much feasible for humans using it, as opposed to a computer and simulation. So the, the way we've done at this, um, this study was uh, we done a mixed method study design. On one hand, we had um, kind of uh, what we call in the wild practices, and I'll describe those in a second. And those come from this app called Fundo from the Citizen Endo project. And then we did a qualitative analysis to get the human perspective on self-management and in particular, the use of AI and reinforcement learning. And where the algorithm comes into account and links these two things is we're gonna use this concept and this framework of RL between the state, the actions and the reward as or agreed to analyze both the quantitative and the qualitative uh, data. So I wanna first tell you about Fando, the app, uh, so that you get a sense of what data we have available to us. Um, so Fando was created about five years ago as an app for self-tracking endometriosis. And originally was not built for uh, self-management, but rather was built as an observational study to um, gather experiences of disease uh, from endometriosis patients. And uh, this theme of enigmatic condition keeps coming back. The idea was um, there's a lot happening in patients' lives, day-to-day -day lives, and learning about them, knowing about them, and collecting them is going to help us build better, better descriptions of the disease. And in fact, in our previous work, we found that uh, this type of data was extremely helpful in even not only describing and phenotyping the disease, but even identifying very um, promising candidates for subtypes of the disease. So the condition, the, the app that we created is called FANDO. It stands for Phenotyping Endometriosis. And here I kind of um, put into two different colors uh, already organizing it towards this idea of self-management. On one day, in blue, on one side in blue are all the questions we ask uh, patients to track that have to do with their state. Uh, so how was your day, uh, which is a, um, you know, a one to five from horrendous to excellent. Those are not the exact words, but I like red scale. Uh, you know, are you on your period? What are, what activities of daily living are difficult to go through? Did you have intercourse today and how was it? Um, pain, GI issues, other signs and symptoms like swelling, uh, fatigue, etc., moods, and uh, patterns of menstrual bleedings. Um, on the other side, there's uh, we're also asking patients to track things that uh, are related to their care and management. And so we provide to them a set of self-management strategies, and they have to tell us which day uh, they've been doing them, which physical activities, which foods. 
uh, hormones and supplements, and the things that have an asterisk next to them are questions that can be um, customized uh, and individualized by patients. So um, it, is, it is a study. It's approved by our IRB. There's an informed consent as part of the app. Uh, and in fact, we, uh, you know, it's eligible for anybody over 13 years old. So how did we get about creating this app is important because, again, we're trying very hard to stick to what the uh, users are experiencing, and we're trying very hard to be human-centered. And so we've done a, uh, a number of, of things to understand which of these questions to ask, as well as which answer to provide. And a lot of our answers are in a structured form. We also have a unrestricted uh, diary functionality in the app. And so we did uh, focus groups with a lot of patients, we did interviews, and we then did surveys to about a thousand patients um, to be able to, um, you know, pinpoint and generalize some of the questions that we have identified were useful to track according to the patients in the focus groups. And finally, we uh, collected a large number of online posts from endometriosis patients in online communities. In this case, this was a subreddit of 15,000 patients. And we used natural language processing to catalog all of the different uh, symptoms and medications used by patients. And the goal there was kind of a, as a sanity check to make sure we were not forgetting uh, any important aspect of the disease. Um, that somehow would not have made it through the interviews and surveys and focus groups. So um, again, this is very similar to the slide I've shown you before, but it's kind of like, you know, how was your day? How, what did you do to self-manage, which are all of these different conditions, uh, questions, and then what happened to me and what is your health state? Uh, these, these, these are some screenshots of the, uh, of the app. Uh, there's moment tracking and there's day-to-day -day tracking. Um, and, you know, the big aspect of the work, uh, which is not very important for this, but is important in ensuring generalizability and quality of the data being captured, is that we, uh, we have very specific way of engaging participants. Uh, we use citizen science principles uh, in uh, in recruiting and engaging patients and returning results to them, as well as um, establishing a partnership in identifying research questions from this large amount of data that we provide. Uh, and because when it comes to these enigmatic diseases, um, advocacy is so needed, um, this data is also considered a way to do uh, advocacy for the disease, and it's something that patients and participants are extremely sensitive and uh, about and interested in. So this is our engagement at the time of the study. We had about 15,000 participants. And you know when we say participant, we mean someone who has consented and has not um, uh, you know, checked out of the, of the study. Um, of those, 12,000.4 had um, an actual endometriosis diagnosis and about nearly 5,000 had tracked at least one week. Those 5,000 participants are the one that we pay the most attention to, so anybody who tracked more than a week. And I'm not talking about, here's some work that I've done uh, with my students and my lab on what type of analysis we've done, but uh, I, I should have put it as a publication, but we've, we've shown that after a week, uh, interestingly, for when it comes to understanding and characterizing the disease, um, we did not need a whole lot of information. Um, when it comes to self-management, we do need information in time, but when it comes to describing the disease and understanding subtypes, um, this cohort of 5,000 people was more than enough. Uh, I've put on the side some, um, you know, more description of our, of our uh, participants. So these are the type of uh, daily engagement counts for uh, all of those, um, those cohorts. And in fact, these are not for the 15,000. I apologize. These are the 5,000 people. That's a mistake again. Um, and, and but basically, I just want you to see that self-management here is pretty high. Uh, and, and that's a good thing for us. That means that people um, want to do self-management. 
uh, we've done much more work looking at who who is engaged in which ways and we found that over these 5,000 people um, there were if we were looking at the first three months of engagement um, and we were able to cluster or participant into four clusters there's some that uh, you know are everyone is engaged in the first week uh, and then some are what we call seldomly engaged. They keep coming back, but for a very small amount of time, not continuously. Then occasional, usuals, and regulars. I'm not showing the results here, but we found that this three months period was actually quite significant because the likelihood of continuing to behave in that way after three months was very based, very much based on how you behave prior to the three months. Um, so, so this was uh, this was quite useful to us, and we further found that regulars and usuals were the ones who were most likely to experiment with self-management strategies and tracking, telling us about it. You know, the other participant might, and uh, we don't know; they're just not um, tracking as much self-management as the others. Um, so, let me tell you about the mixed method analysis that we've done. Now that I've given you some um background on the on this particular data that we're going to be analyzing so uh we looked here for analysis at what we call the fando rl cohort which are anybody who had logged any self-management uh in their in their uh trajectory and so this could be someone who's here or someone who's here as long as they have logged a self-management strategy we're interested in what they have to say about it and that included 10,000 users uh, with records across a 1,800 days. Of those, uh, they had, uh, of these 1,800 days, there were about 400,000 answers to the FENDO questions and about 300 instances, 300,000 instances of self management. So we call, we decided to call a trial a kind of like a, a couple of things, a pair of things, which was a pre-data, self-management instant, and post-data. So maybe the day before, the day of self-management, and the day after. We looked at analyzing this data by characterizing all of the different strategies, and by that I mean looking for the breadth of strategies, as well as how long and how often users engage with these strategies, and to quantify the effects of these strategies. And so here we're trying to um, really validate our hypothesis. Is it the case that people are trying different things? You know, patients have told us so. We've identified this in the previous study, but since we have this data, is that actually what we see in the data? And when it comes to population and individual effects of strategies, um, if our hypothesis is correct that there are heterogeneous responses to, to strategies, we should see differences at the population and individual levels. We also did a qualitative analysis to try to understand beyond these challenges, um, specifically what would be um, what would be problems or unintended consequences or what would be um, promises of using automated recommendations for self-management. And so we went back to our focus group, we did additional, um, additional uh, semi-structured interviews, and we did a directed content analysis looking for, um, specifically looking at this grid of analysis from the RL state reward and action uh, kind of framework. So we found eight findings, and I'm gonna go through each of them. Uh, so, they all had to do with, I'm, I'm putting back uh, this framework of the RL, the agent, the state, the reward, the actions. And let me tell you about the, um, the eight findings. So two of them, the first two were related to self-management. There's a broad action space and people want to explore this space of self-management, but they really care about their autonomy. There's on the state space, there were also two findings, which were that um, the illness, everyday, and context variables had to be taken into account into the, the state, and that there needed to have a something about the just-in-time aspect of self-management. 
finally, there was uh, on the goal, uh, there was interest in short term goals in particular, so short term indicators for the goals and the reward function. And finally, on the agent and the actual recommendations, um, there was this high, um, these three findings that uh, both the mixed, the, the quantitative and the qualitative analysis showed us that there is definitely heterogeneity in answers to recommendations. And so a population level um, recommendations would not be appropriate here. And so we're looking for an N of one or purely individualized recommendation learning. Explainable recommendations were needed and engagement patterns that we've seen in the data from um, the way people interact with self-management was sufficient for reinforcement learning. In other words, if we were to use um, a simple algorithm, not the deep learning one for RL, we might have enough data. Uh, it is feasible with the way people naturally engage with data to learn something that would be useful. So let me go through them one by one and give you a little bit more details about them. So the first finding was that the scope of the action space was broad across the population of users and individuals often combine multiple strategies. And so this was um, how many strategies uh, user track at the same time. And, um, and there's a fairly high number of strategies, uh, you know, like up to 15, but, uh, you know, a lot of people track five, uh, up to five strategies at the same time. What was interesting to us was that what we call the Fando vocabulary, which were these self-management strategies that we had identified when we had uh, designed the app. So example of those would be a heat pack, um, use of CBD or, you know, talk therapy, acupuncture. There were a lot of those, but there were also a lot of uh, customized and um, individualized new strategies that people were coming up with and uh, consistently tracking. Secondly, users were willing to explore the action space, but control of action space, it was still very important. So what do I mean by that? Uh, patients would tell us things like, I'm willing to try anything, but, um, but they also wanted something to say like, okay, I would be, I would want to give feedback on whether I would want to try a particular strategy or not or maybe I would want to postpone the strategy to another time. There was this desire to give in, input to um, what maybe the level of difficulty uh, of a strategy, uh, or maybe some refusal about the fact that some of these strategies can be uh, costly or might require uh, access to resources that the patients did not have access to. The third finding was that experiences of illness and everyday variable and context were going to be important for characterizing the state space. So this is important for us because it informs how we want to operationalize this RL learning. What will we, will we be modeling in the state space? And it turns out it's going to be complex because patients had wanted rich representation of their health status, but also of the broader environment. Uh, a patient told us you need to have a head to toe kind of analysis, but at the same time, a holistic view of the body. Um, you know, we do know that um, patients track many different types of uh, context, what we call context variables, like typical day to day and flare ups. Uh, and so we have some elements of answer in our data as to what could be going into this state. Um, I'll go back to this in the discussion. There are still things that like that have to do with just in time that we don't have access to, such as, you know, um, it would be lovely to know, is it snowing today um, when we're about to recommend to someone to go outside and walk? Um, users want just in time intervention, and we need this contextual information, like what I just said. So, a patient told us, I like the push of, hey, stretch right now. Uh, I typically implement those type of things when my threshold for pain has gotten so high to the point where I can't sing, and that's where I would want to go and do this. And so basically what the patients are telling us here is that um, the responses would need to be with um, 
very much aligned to this recommendation would need to be very much aligned with how the users are feeling and what they're doing in real time. Uh, I should mention here that this idea of just in time recommendation has been heavily, um, you know, investigated using reinforcement learning, in fact, by, um, by a lot of investigators, but I'm thinking in particular of the work of Susan Murphy at Harvard, uh, looking at it in the, in the context of recommending physical activity. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of what we found in our qualitative analysis is very much aligned with what Susan Murphy has found as well. Um, it is very, however, difficult to capture the context of daily life. Uh, and so, you know, I mentioned snow as an example, but patients tell us that it doesn't even have to be external things. It could also be, you know, what am I, what headspace am I in when, when something is suggested to me? Users were looking for short-term self-management, but still, um, you know, that does that kind of hints at us what the reward function should be, but it doesn't completely uh, specify what it should be. Uh, and so um, here, I guess what I'm showing to you is that some would say that pain is definitely the reward function of interest. Others might say that it might be a... Um, a daily an activity of daily life that is a specific goal of them. And I think here, when we are building these models, we have to decide, are we um, learning, um, you know, are we, which type, are we building techniques that are generalized to any goal or are we uh, really focusing on a particular goal? I think for us, what we've looked at so far is this idea of reduction in pain as a goal because it felt like a general and frequent enough goal uh, talked by patients. And what we find is that there is a lot of trials, these triplets of pre something post, uh, you know, strategy and post strategy information about whole that would help us uh, get a sense of what is the effect size of different strategies. And then Speaking of effect size, self-management heterogeneity calls for a tailored recommendation and N of one RL. So I want to point out here that I've been using words a little bit in a, in a non-specific way, such as individualized, personalized, and tailored. And I think we don't have yet the exact answer of what it is that we want to do, um, but there's definitely something personalized or something specific to the individual that will need to be done whether the algorithm can be informed by the population as a whole and then um, kind of uh, uh, fine-tuned on an individual or whether we should ignore the population entirely and only model a single individual's trajectory. Those are questions for us to understand. But what we find here uh, is that uh, we've seen in the data what patients had been telling us that people see widely different answers uh, so this is an example, not even about running, but about walking, where at the population, it looks like there's not really, you know, there's a range of, of answers to walking with respect to pain. And there are definitely patients for which um, pain is harmed by walking. Uh, final to, last to final is that users wanted a tool with explainable recommendations. This is a theme that comes back often in human-centered AI, um, and it has to do with trust. Um, you know, if an explanation is provided, it can help the user decide why they should, uh, they should do it. And maybe, you know, after some time and trusting the algorithm, they might not need to have these explanations, but it might also help them um, understand what alternatives to look into if they understand the reason. And finally, uh, engagement patterns suggest that in our data, in FANDO in particular, or there's enough uh, and frequent enough to uh, actually learn a basic RL uh, algorithm. And this is really good news for us um, because maybe there's something we need to tweak in the way we, we collect the data, but that tells us that in their wild states, um, in the wild, patients do already have this, uh, this ability to track and take advantage of, of tracking both the self-management strategies as well as how they're feeling before and after. So I want to I want to finish here and um, you know tell you um, a little bit about the feasibility 
uh, an engagement pattern, but really tell you about the design opportunity. And those are the ones that I think are important. Um, and in a way, I'm focusing here very, very much on the human-centered AI aspect of it. There's a lot of technological questions, but I want to focus here on the human AI collaboration. So one is this idea of control and autonomy, explainability, context, and individual versus population. I, I've mentioned those here and there, but um, there are. this is informing what type of RL we want to be doing. There's a lot of human in the loop uh, approaches for human input. The capture of context is going to be a major uh, challenge. Um, explainability, we know, is going to help us build trust. And individual population is this question of, you know, we're going to need to figure out to which extent are we doing a hybrid population slash individual or a fully N of one type of model. But we know for sure we don't want to do a population on the type of model. So um, those are my final thoughts. Uh, personal health informatics is useful. Individual recommendations are needed. AI can help. There's a lot of challenges. And I didn't talk about one that is really important, which is safety. Um, but I will stop right here and thank my collaborators, my students, and my lab members, as well as the National Library of Medicine and the Endometriosis Foundation of America. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noemi. It was fascinating. I'll just say, just on a personal note, my sister suffered from this condition. <laughs> so I have much personal history in listening to her and, and understanding what she went through. But I'm really tempted to ask you a, a question since you listed these design options, control and autonomy, context, explainability, individual versus population. Is one of those a direction you want to continue on or all of them? <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> the answer is all of them. Um, okay. But in particular, in particular, the personalization, I think, is, is the one that is going to be the, the primary one for now. Interesting. We mentioned before, this will be your excellent talk will be stored on the NIH video cast. So videocast at NIH.gov. And people can go to the past events, lectures, and find it. <laughs> so it'll probably take us a little while, but for people who, um, for your whole community of users who might be interested, right? The people who participated with you and also your team Absolutely. Absolutely. who might have missed it and others. Um, and any last thoughts you want to share? Otherwise, we'll say thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.